and welcome. My name is Dan. And this is the beginning of an introductory course that we call Becoming a Journey Guide. And by a journey, we mean a meditation, a guided meditation, that is about five minutes in length, is highly transmissive, and we'll talk about what that means. And therefore, we believe highly impactful. And it's designed to allow you to share and communicate with your audiences. And it's also designed to provide content and understanding so your audience can debrief afterwards. In other words, sharing their experiences with one another. If you haven't had a chance, take a look at our book called Wake Up Curious. And this book will give you some insights to what we're trying to do in the world. The vision statement for Wake Up Curious is very simple. Deeper connections with self, others in the universe. And presumably this resonates with you, and that's why you're here. And most likely, you're some kind of personal growth practitioner, a wellness coach, an energy healer, anything in between and beyond. So I invite you to enjoy this overall journey with us as we show you what seems to work for us with others. We believe strongly in the democratization of spirituality. There's not a time anymore. It's too urgent to have secrets and mystery schools. It's all open source. So we're sharing everything we know with you. And no doubt we will learn from you as well. Is it really possible to have meditation benefits in just five minutes? Lee, it's so great to be here with you to present this course of Becoming a Journey Guide as part of the Wakuri system. I wonder if uh, you'd like to tell our audience a bit about your background. Great, Dan. It's delightful to be here with you. My background is over 20 years of integrative energy work and learning uh, in a number of methodologies, uh, ranging from shamanism to Reiki, uh, to Brazilian techniques and um, also yogic techniques. I'm also a meditation teacher. And for me, all of these things are really integrative in the sense of how we're working with Bukuri because it's welcoming of all techniques and it brings many different backgrounds with your diverse background uh, coming from you know, Aikido and uh, many different experiences that you had, I find the same that I can actually integrate my background into the Wakuri method and how we work together through this system. So for me, it's very open and all embracing. Um, no matter where you're coming from, it enables people to quickly connect. Thank you, Lee. And I think that's a really important point. There's nothing about these methodologies that are religious or even, you know, strictly traditionally spiritual, right? Um, and so everyone's welcome and everyone's expertise and everyone's experience and diversity and inclinations and points of view are absolutely welcome. We call this one of our purposes is the democratization of spirituality. So it isn't just a thing for certain people. You know, during my career, I've met many, many people who delve deeply into the energetic realms, but they are in the closet about it. They don't talk about it because they're scared or maybe it's different. And what Lee has pointed out is, is, is part of our process. Everyone is extraordinary and everyone has a way to access their deeper, higher self and being and their knowledge of the universe. But some people are still learning and maybe a little scared about it, or a little nervous. Probably most of you taking this course are already well on that path. Um, but you may still be harboring some doubts or uncertainties about your strength or your power to, to share and to help others heal and learn. Our experience is that everyone has this capacity, and that's why we're offering this course, right? To amplify your existing strengths and knowledge to perhaps add a few new insights. 
Absolutely. But we don't want you to think about us as teachers. We want you to think about us as facilitators and catalysts. So Lee and I are going to start a discussion a minute after I come into my background. But really, what we're asking you to self-direct is be in the conversation in your own mind. You have all the wisdom in the world hidden in the middle of your heart and your soul if you don't already know that. So like Leah, I have a comprehensive um, kind of complex background. I, I like to say that my only superpower is I know how to stumble and then get up again and just keep stumbling. So I've stumbled into many great practices over the years. Starting with Aikido, I have my black belt in Aikido. But I wasn't satisfied to know how to move and be in harmony on the dojo. I, I wanted to apply those principles of ki or chi, as Japanese call it, ki, life force energy, into the workplace and into my relationships. And so I spent many years experimenting and often flubbing that. But along the way, I tried many different forms of meditation, and I found a meditation form that matched my Aikido practice, even though it was from the Western a theosophical tradition. So it kind of, it's kind of a mishmash, the same way that Lee's described her background. I have spent some time um, as the CEO of the Deepak Chopra Foundation, and I've worked with Ken Wilber and uh, Mike, uh, Mike Murphy from Esalen and those kinds of Barbara Marks Hubbard, wonderful people. And they've all been incredible mentors for me. As we find our way into what does it mean to be a journey guide, I please want you to understand that we stumbled into it. <laughs> it wasn't a plan. It just emerged. Right? It was sort of waiting to be found and expressing itself. The way I've been saying it recently, when see people say, oh, thank you, Dan, this is really helpful, I'm like, it's not me. <laughs> okay, It may be coming through me, but it's not me. I think you bring up a point that's really important about the method. I think the spontaneity is really key and also sort of getting out of our own way, allowing ourselves to really be led by the heart, be really open, and to allow ourselves to receive the information we already have within us. And that's a key part of this course and a key part of the method itself is how we get out of our own way just to let what is there, the wisdom that is already there to flow through us. And uh, that's what's really a great gift is when we do that, we can see the flow of this information through ourselves as a, in a transmissive way, but also see the wisdom and the flow that comes from others uh, when we synchronize and collaborate together. So this is, is really an incredible part of this course. And it's also an incredible part of the journey of the Wakuri Method. Thank you, Leah. It's a really good point. And to be clear, every single journey you will ever listen to is spontaneous. And most often, not always, but most often, so too are the topics. So the challenge is to accomplish what Leah just described. How can we be present enough in the moment to take a topic that occurs to us or that someone else gives us and not know what's going to come out of our mouths and to trust that flow and that presencing? related to the topic. There are many, many days when I'm recording journeys or giving them live where I'm totally surprised by the next phrase that comes out and I'm actually learning, as strange as that sounds. So what a journey is not is deciding to say something and then saying it. Right? It's the opposite, to pick up on Leah's point. Of course, think about it. When you're in your highest flow with a client or a customer or an organization or however you characterize your business practices, you're most likely not deciding ahead of time. You have a framework or training as we do. Of course, it comes into play, but you're trying, we would think, to be present with them and their needs. This is no different. It's just in a particular form that we found is powerful. I do want to comment on the concept of transmissions. What we found is that the more spontaneous and relaxed we are with that opening and that channeling and that flowing, it's more impactful for people. And the reason we believe it is, it is what we call, what the ancients call transmissions, the exchange of energy across time and space, whether recorded or live, doesn't matter. So we will talk a little more about what is the transmissive journey, but this is an introduction to that whole world. Absolutely. And one point I'd like to add to that, uh, Dan, 
is in my teaching practice. So I um, regularly teach uh, meditation students um, in the workplace and elsewhere. Um, what I also find is that when you're really connected to a group of people through doing journeys at the Wakuri method or in other settings, what actually happens is you're listening to the resonant biofield or you're, you're listening to the resonant energy of what's present in the room. You're just, it's happening spontaneously and you're giving a journey that's relevant to the people that you're in presence with and in communion with. And I think it's really amazing how you have a journey, you have the experience and you do the feedback, which is part of the process of Wakuri. And then you find out that one of the people in the room had been focused on this particular topic that you actually had the journey on at a different time in their life. And therefore, it's relevant to them without anyone else knowing about it. So I think this is something that, that Dan was just articulating, that if we're open and in the flow, these sorts of journeys can emerge and be fully appropriate for whoever's participating. Yeah, thank you, Leah. You know, I, you're speaking to what I often call the wisdom of the community or the crowd. So it's quite true that when I record a journey, even in a studio like we are now, I'm imagining the listeners. You know, one of the discussion points we wanted to cover was that this whole question of, well, it's just five minutes. It's very brief. And when my colleagues first asked me to create journeys that were just five minutes, I was frankly resistant and said, five minutes? I teach all weekend or I teach in 20-minute sets or whatever. But they said, look, we're really busy guys and gals and we don't, you know, we only have five minutes and we can't convince ourselves of, to do more than five minutes. So I meditated on that, of course, and, and found a way in which that transmissive effect can be strong enough that it frankly transcends time and space. I now believe in experience it doesn't matter whether it's 30 seconds or one minute or 20 minutes or a day-long meditation. It matters what is the energetic flow pattern. So we just want to, you know, and there, now there's many, many apps out there that are just five minutes or ten minutes. And so the world is discovering that it doesn't matter how long it is, it matters what the quality of the experience is. But I want to add another piece. Because not only are these journeys for people to listen to, but as Leah just intimated, they're journeys for people to debrief afterwards, to talk to one another in the afterglow of that space. And we believe that that's one of the most powerful impacts of this particular method. Imagine it, taking what is often called in the Buddhist community a Sangha, which is sacred community, and creating a cyber, uh, an internet version, a cyber Sangha, which is allowing people to find one another online, not to talk about the latest fashion or how they're grooming their pets or politics, but to go deep into a moment of one of these journeys or one of your journeys when you create them and then to share with a small or a large group online in a live moment. And that turns out to be what we think and we call the shared biofield, right? Scientists are now beginning to measure what is an energy field. The ancients have been talking about it for thousands of years. It turns out that most of us are starting to understand and experience that everyone and everything has an energy field, or scientifically now called by the NIH, biofields. And our biofields interact. Think about it. Think about a great moment in a relationship or a friendship or with a work colleague or a small group where everything is just in harmony and inventive and creative and peaceful and safe. That would be the shared biofield in its best sense. So these are some of the background concepts. What kinds of journeys give the greatest benefits? Another question that we get often, Leah, and I wonder what your response would be is, what kinds of journeys give the greatest benefits? What kind of journey topics? The range of journeys is so diverse that, in fact, you can actually receive benefits from any kind of a journey. So as long as the group and the resonance of the group is there and the transmission is coming through, the journey can be about anything. It can be about moving through time and space. It can be about nature. It can be about inner discovery. 
It can be about really any topic and through being connected to that topic and allowing yourself to move into the flow and follow the energy of that topic, it can actually have a high impact irrespective of the diverse topics that we are currently creating and generating a library about. So we've had a, a bit of everything from the power of a wave to journey to the inner child to journey into nature. There's many, many topic areas. And I wouldn't say that one or the other is necessarily uh, more impactful. I would actually say that it, it's about the resonance to that topic that generates the personal impact for each individual. So that's what makes it so unique. Sometimes we find ourselves doing journeys to apparently innocuous topics. My favorite example is journey to a slug. And people would say, well, wh why would you do a journey to a slug? It's greasy and ugly and it's eating my garden. Well, I've done a journey to a slug. <laughs> and it was incredible, right, to discover what these beans are and how these creatures work and how they are part of the food chain. But the point is this. We're discovering, and we've in our 350 recorded journeys, that's how many we have. It's how much fun we have doing them. We kind of can't stop doing them. That everything is incredible and everything is awesome. It doesn't matter if it's a piece of granite. It doesn't matter if it's a memory of your ancestors. It doesn't matter if it's soaking into your trauma in a way that you hope to transform it. Everything can be discovered at a deeper level through this method and however and whenever you're ready. Eventually people will be able to have access to a large portion of that library and choose what journey they want to go on with friends that attracts them. And yes, there are some people that say, wow, I really enjoyed that journey or that topic more than that topic. That's fine. If we're going to end up with a thousand journey topics, you can pick and choose. And of course, what we hope will happen in the beginning of the growth of the Curious Live or Mercury community is that you're going to recommend journey topics, things we have never imagined. And as you start to learn to create your own journeys for your own audiences and clients, you're going to come up with topics relevant to them, as Leah talked about. There is that moment in the sacred space where you often find yourself speaking, if you're facilitating or leading, to exactly the need of that group. Well, now we're dealing virtually, and so we're imagining that group. But I'll give you an example. Some people who have been in the recent California fires have approached us and asked us to do journeys to the transformation of evacuation or the transformation of the fears around fires, about returning home or not. So we're going to do that. We're going to find a series of topics related to their traumas and their fears and their, their PTSD that we hope will be helpful for them. There is no topic that you cannot go deeper into and if you're in that higher flow state we're talking about, there will be some benefit for someone somewhere on this planet. I think this leads to another important point, Dan, is about the power of the imagery that is evoked during a journey. So even if the topic can be challenging and stretch us, you know, such as returning to a traumatic event and uh, going into that journey, I think the power of the natural imagery and the the emergence of the vocabulary and the flow of the image that comes as part of the journey and just being on that and allowing yourself to proceed through it is actually very healing and transformative. So for example, going into outer space and imagining outer space and what that may be like and the expansiveness and great possibility of that. The deep imagery that you evoke within yourself by going into such a journey is, is actually transformative within you because it allows you, moving through time and space, to actually experience that outer realm inside of your mind. We now know that with physics and the development of all of the new measurements with the biofield, etc., that we actually have a greater capacity than we ever thought possible in the past. We have a great capacity to transform using our own mind, using our own heart, and using our own intent. So by moving into a new space and 
by allowing ourselves to visualize something in a detailed way, it can completely open us to something new and it can shift us from moment to moment. Yeah, thank you, Lee. And you know, you're reminding me of pre television days. And the phrase that was used for radio was the theater of the imagination, which is what this process is about. And the imagination isn't just pretend, it turns out the body responds physiologically as if it were actually happening, whatever you're imagining. We now know that on a scientific level. Leah, you mentioned a journey into space, and I, I'm just kind of inspired to do a journey, if you would allow me to. Absolutely. All right. We're going to do a journey, and I think you might find it fun, and it, the topic just came out of some of Leah's comments. Take a nice couple of deep breaths in your own rhythm, please. And adjust your posture to be comfortable, if you haven't already. And come with me on a journey to a star seed. It's not just a star. And it's not just a seed. Imagine now that together you are soaring off the planet into space. And you're safe. You're covered in a bubble of light and oxygen. and There's no problem. You have an energetic spaceship. You're soaring high above the Earth, past the moon, past our planets, out of our little solar system, into the essence of our galaxy, beautiful spiral. But then beyond that galaxy, see the spiral now, fading in the background. We're traveling very quickly. But we're not traveling without intention or direction. Imagine now that you're feeling a pull almost like gravity, which is impossible where you are, but it's pulling you in a certain direction, calling you. And you find yourself in a place you've never seen before, surrounded by galaxies and galaxy clusters and stars and planets you've never seen from the Earth's sky. And finally you are still suspended in space. And just looking around, what do you see? What do you feel? And then you notice somewhere off on one side or the other of your vision, a star that seems to be blinking at you, like a light, like a signal. And it seems to be maybe colored a little bit, blue or red or who knows. And it seems to be somehow wanting to connect with you. And so you get a little bit closer in your easy ability to travel. Take your magic spaceship and just drift towards that ball of fire and energy and wisdom and light. And you get a little closer, not close enough to be fearful or damaged by its heat or its nuclear power, just close enough to regard it. And then you become aware, of course that it is regarding you. I take a moment and just feel that possibility. What does it mean to be regarded by a star? What does it mean to regard one? And now you begin to get the feeling, and then rest with it for a moment, that you know this star, and it knows you. Just sit with that. And if a star is wisdom, not just chemicals, and if a star is history and knowledge and not just nuclear explosions, and if a star has its own energy field, you are interacting with its energy field now, and it with yours. 
And now you begin to suspect this star is trying to communicate with you. And you're asking, what is the message? And slowly, but surely, star sends you a message across time and space about your life and your purpose and your growth. You don't quite grasp what the message is, but there's something coming. It's planting a seed in you that will grow in the coming weeks, months, and years into clarity and understanding. It's gifting you an insight. Feel that possibility. Open your body. Let it enter. It cannot hurt you. Hold it in your heart. And now, it's time to leave and say goodbye and head back towards Earth just as easily as you headed up here. Finding our galaxy, finding the Earth, diving back down to the place you started from. But there's something different now. There's a crystal, there's a, an energy, there's something in the middle of your heart which you will be only too delighted to discover in the coming times. And when you're ready, give thanks. Come back into the room and have a wonderful day. So, Lee, if you want to share your experiences, that would be great. Sure, Dan, that was an amazing journey. I feel very in sync to it because of the conversation earlier about the possibilities of space and its expansiveness. So, for me, this journey really uh, brought me to the star seed. It was amazing. Very quickly and simply, I was there, I was with you. And some really beautiful messages uh, came came just immediately out of that encounter. And what came was uh, almost spontaneously was the uh, the sense of unity with the star seed. So that there's a, I think there's a quote from from a, I'm not sure which famous author, but that we are basically made of stardust. And the impression that came from this star was very clear. It was that we are one that we are one and the same. And in such an expansive and conscious universe, this was a beautiful possibility that just came simply and easily, and it just landed gently in my heart. So that was quite a profound and uh, deep experience, traveling far, yet returning home with such an insight. Thank you, Leah. And that's a good example for our course members here. I was inspired by Lee's small, quick, but intense conversation about space. And that notion just emerged into my presence. Uh, and I chose to honor it. By So did we plan to do that? No, we absolutely did not. <laughs> this entire conversation is unscripted, in case you weren't clear about that. Why spontaneous journeys have more juice? Let's move on, Leah, if we can, to why spontaneous journeys have more juice. A lot of meditation apps are fantastic and people do really well with them, but they're very often scripted, which is fine. Um, but if you think about the ancient traditions, where someone is facilitating Sangha or Dharma or different kinds of experiences, they're, they're mostly almost exclusively spontaneous. And to think about conversations with friends or in relationships, that the best moments are usually unplanned. In fact, they're often the best things that happen that you could never have imagined. So spontaneity sort of takes the human mind chatter and shunts it to the side. And this allows us to be more present in each moment and let it unfold. And honestly, on the flip side of spontaneity, 
can be meant much joy, much exploration, even if it's going through a discovery of something difficult. So I wondered if you wanted to comment on why spontaneity is so important. You touched on it earlier, but maybe you'd like to expand on it. Absolutely, Dan. So for me, uh, the value of the spontaneous journey and the value of uh, this type of uh, connectivity with others is because you're actually connecting to a greater purpose. So you're opening yourself up to being present. You're opening yourself up to the other people that you're engaging with. And you're opening yourself up to a sense of flow. And when we do that, the, the information that comes through is often so pointed and appropriate for the audience that we're working with that it's actually amazing and so so sometimes surreal that it is perfectly appropriate at the time and place and the message that's required just because it was spontaneous and just because it arrived in the moment and it was in fact exactly what the person needed. So for me, that um, that is something that it has a very uh, magical quality when we allow ourselves to learn and understand about a transmissive journey and also get to know the difference between something that is scripted versus something that is transmissive and spontaneous and just feeling the difference of what that's like when we experience it ourselves. Thank you, Leah. You know, many people report that when they're in that more spontaneous space, you know, something is coming through them. It goes back to the not me comment I made earlier. Something's flowing through them. But I also want to add another angle to this. <clears throat> you know, sharing after a journey is also spontaneous, right? There's no script. I mean, there maybe there's a few questions. How are you feeling? How was that journey? That's about it. So think about a genuine conversation you've ever had with anybody, friend, a loved one, colleague, even a stranger. It's spontaneous, right? It just happens. You don't... If you enter into a conversation with a script, it's going to be a disaster, right? <laughs> by definition. And then by, the opposite is also to enter into a conversation. The more present you are in the moment, the more likely you're going to learn something and feel something and get to know the other person and vice versa. And so these are spontaneous journeys that are then followed by spontaneous conversation, all inviting us to be present in each moment, whether a recorded moment or, or a live moment. So there's, you know, there's no doubt <clears throat> that we know that the spontaneity allows that kind of <clears throat> connection. You know, this our work is about deeper connection with self, others, and the universe. And it's spontaneity in any moment of your life, whether it's with a tree or a child or, or a sunset or yourself, allows that connectivity to happen. Absolutely. And I think it's one of those things that is, is uh, simply felt. So it's a felt experience that you can often just feel within your own heart um, as to how something resonates with you, how something feels when you experience it, and also the sort of truth that you come to when you finish a journey. Because often there can be deeper truths that arrive in a very short amount of time that actually resonate with you for days afterwards. So um, many times a simple insight, such as the journey we just we just did together about journeying to space and to the star seed, that type of insight that I experienced of being considering myself one with that star and the unity uh, with which I experienced that journey is something that I'm sure I can feel it really resonating with me. And I'm sure that will last for days within me as an insight I can carry and reflect on and nurture as an understanding. So I think it's really up to us to take this, this method and to take the, the learnings that we have from journeys and really integrating them into ourselves and then allowing that to deepen. I think you're 100% right on this. And, you know, for the, for the people who are participating in this course, think about the state of your being. That's the biggest offering you have for your clients and your friends and your loved ones. 
And really what we're learning to do is to manage our state of being before we do give a journey. To, in order to be open to the kind of process Leah just described so well, you have to be centered, you have to be relaxed, you have to be not dominated by your mind chatter. There's a discipline involved, there's a practice involved. And some of you who are participating may already be very good at that, and some of you may be still be on your learning curve. I think we're always on a learning curve, but it's one of the reasons I like to do journeys and record them and do them live because it, it requires me to use my practice and skills to be focused and disciplined and not just thinking about <clears throat> my to-do list or my calendar or the needs or wants of others or my phone or the world or whatever. And we live in a hugely distracted society and we're hoping to use this to change that story. You know, one of the purposes of Curious.Live and Mercury is to help end loneliness, existential loneliness. And the reason we put it that way is because we see ourselves, all of us, living very disconnected lives. It's the impact of technology on the negative side, the impact of, of mass media, the impact of the demands on our lives, which just seem to be getting crazier and crazier and busier and busier. And there has to be something counterintuitive to find, to take us back to a different realm where life is simpler and more peaceful uh, and also crazy making, because if you look at all the research, and there's a lot of it out now on loneliness, you know, loneliness leads to depression, stress, and in the worst cases, what they call deaths of despair, right? Suicides, addiction, et cetera, et cetera. And those things are all on the increase in our current well, Western culture right now. So, all right, let's admit it. Sometimes when we're on Facebook, we're actually lonely. But so-called connection in the internet can be the opposite, can be alienating, especially when you get into um, people who are ragging on people and, and people who are creating negative memes. So we live in this very strange moment in time for humanity. We desperately need to be more connected than ever, and at many levels, many people are disconnected. So let's be clear about our purpose here, and I'm sure it's the purpose of your work as a participant in this course. It's about deepening the connections, starting with yourself. Right? Starting, if you're having to heal, to learn how to heal yourself. Starting with your friends and your loved ones and going out from there. The Meditative Power of Natural Imagery If you think about it, we do a lot of journeys on nature. I don't know how many we have, Leah, but there's countless, probably a hundred or more. And I wonder, you know, why? How come so we like to do so many journeys to something in nature? And, you know, we have a journey we're going to ask the course participants to listen to in a minute uh, that we pre-recorded called Journey to a Tree. Uh, but why is it? Why is it? What is it about nature? Where are our opportunities and how come we, we're doing those journeys and how come our people who listen to them and share afterwards seem to really, really uh, get into them? Well, from my perspective, Dan, the, the key here is really about being more grounded. And when we connect to nature, that enables us to just really feel a broader and deeper connection uh, to not just ourselves, but to the universe in a, in a broader sense, right? So, you know, if you just consider um, connecting to the, the life forms that are on this planet, such as the trees and plants and, and animals, uh, this gives us a broader connection. It sees outside of ourselves and allows us to move beyond the individual ego self to a broader sort of human self, the soul self, the bigger who we are, the higher who we are, right? And in doing that, uh, nature gives us that expansiveness and nature gives us a new perspective and it gives us a new connection. So by connecting broadly to nature, this allows us to really come back to our true selves and to recalibrate to who we are and who we can be as a higher being on this planet. So I think that's why we have so many journeys about nature and that's why the journeys to nature are very powerful uh, because of this, this really important um, transformation that occurs when we connect to the natural world. Leah, I, I think grounding, as you've identified, is a critical issue for all of us, especially those of us in the healing arts, but generally in life. 
And I think you've nailed that in terms of of why most of us really enjoy uh, connecting with nature in our own lives or or through these processes. You know, and it's interesting, some of these journeys are very scalable. And by that I mean, you can not only journey to a tree, but you can journey to a cell in one corner of a root of a tree. You can not only journey to a bird, you can be flying with the bird in a flock of birds when thousands are migrating. You can not only take a journey to the mineral kingdom, but you can in your imagination, pick up a piece of gravel and dive into it, et cetera, et cetera. So at any scale, a sunrise, a star, a tiny scale, a large scale, we can go exploring this incredible planet we live on, right? So there's no limit. There's literally no limit to the depths of exploration. Uh, the only limit is our imagination. And I find that um, somebody said to me once, well, I guess you've done enough nature journeys. I'm like, well, no, I don't think so. I could never do enough nature journeys. There's, there, I can feel a thousand more ready to come. And I'm sure that's going to happen to you when you become a journey guide, that <clears throat> your love of nature or a particular tree or a particular place or whatever it is that works for you, if you're lucky enough to have access to something natural, um, will happen for you. And I would also say this, what I find when I do a journey to something in nature is it's the, it's the something in nature that is doing the journey. Right, this journey you'll listen to in a few minutes, this journey to a tree, is actually instructed and guided to me. And this is an important thing as a journey guide. If I'm, if we're channeling, and I think we are, I don't shy away from that word, but I'm not necessarily channeling, channeling higher spirits or energies, although I do that too. You're channeling the essence of the topic that's emerged. So let's listen for a moment now to that journey. And then we'll reflect on it. And I'm just giving us a pause point, guys, because then you can play the five-minute journey. Now that you've listened to that journey, I hope that you have some comments and reflections about your relationship to trees, your relationship to the purpose of trees that came out in that journey. And it, again, that was a spontaneous journey uh, that just happened in one of our recording sessions. And as an example of what you might do, you might pick your favorite tree, which is where this journey, of course, started. Uh, and you might pick your favorite flower. You might pick a, a, a bird that keeps showing up in your windowsill. Or you might pick anything that occurred to you and go there. Because when you take people there, you're taking yourself there. And when you go there, that energy of that part of nature flows through you. And now as part of this course, now that you've listened to the journey to a tree, I'd invite you to, as we are sharing and thinking about this, I'd invite you to write down your thoughts and to really record your experience of that journey. I think this is a really integral part because you're listening to this course at home, but that you actually have a chance to reflect and make note of your own experiences and what that felt like for you. And by doing this, it'll allow you to rather synthesize what the messages and information that occurred during that journey so that you can look back on it and reflect on it. Also, as part of this course, we'd recommend that over time, you listened to the journeys more than once. And again, record your thoughts and feelings about that journey each time. And as you reflect and go through this course, it will be very important for you to look back on your notes and to understand the changes and the experiences you've had over the course of the different meditations and journeys you've experienced. So you can develop yourself and see your growth over time. This is a great suggestion, Leah. Thank you so much for that. And let me add one more to it. If you'd like to take any one of these journeys and play it for a group of your friends or colleagues, and share afterwards to practice the art of sharing, that is fine by us. There's no problem with that. Our journeys are on, on platforms around the world where people can listen to them. But in this case, if you take a journey you like or you found impactful, the one to trees or others to come, or some already in our inventory available to you, um, have a little coffee party. Let's do a journey or two and share afterwards. And the sharing is very simple. 
it's to hold that space for people if you're facilitating the sharing. And in that quiet, respectful few moments after a journey is played, ask people if they have any comments or observations. How are their bodies feeling? What are their thoughts and emotions? And some people won't share or don't have anything to share or they're still in the journey. And some people will have a lot to say. What we found is that the sharing is often very deep and very authentic. So we give you that opportunity and we'll figure out a way how to do the technology on that for you. Tapping the power of your childhood memories. Leah, let's move on to this whole question of another kind of journey. We've been talking about journeys to nature, which is tapping into the power of childhood memories. Okay. Okay. Uh, Leah, we've been talking about journeys to nature and how wonderful they are. And now let's move on to the whole idea of tapping into the power of childhood memories. When you and I were doing some earlier recordings, <clears throat> I did a journey uh, that you listened to and shared on um, a journey to our inner child. And I, I wonder if you wanted to share some of your experiences with that with, the, with our uh, audience listening today. Absolutely. Uh, for me, the journey, any journey that moves through and allows us to return to our inner child and to experience it deeply, it's, it's kind of like um, a deep inner softening of the heart. It's allowing yourself to step outside of who you are right now. The person you may be, the roles, all of the different things that you're currently in your life representing, you know, you may be a, a parent, you may be, you know, working, you may be um, a brother, a sister. All of these different roles in society that we may play are one thing. But when we return to an, a journey on an inner child perspective, we go deep inside ourselves and we step out of those roles and we suddenly see a different angle of who we are. And it allows us to soften to our own self, letting go of the ego and just returning to a really pure place, a place that enables healing and it enables an openness and a new understanding of our inner self to emerge. So I find the journeys to, an, to the inner child very, very heartwarming and also uh, really a softening that happens when we go to our inner child that just allows us to kind of feel like we're having a warm hug for ourselves and stepping outside of our current roles and current understanding of who we are. Thank you, Leah. I think that's a <clears throat> great description. I have the same experience when I, I listen to a journey like that from myself or others. Or, And I wonder if, it, I'm just going to ask you, Leah, you don't have to do this, but I wonder if you'd like to lead us in a journey to the inner child today. Sure. So let us just take a moment to relax, close our eyes, and feel settled. As we exhale, just settling deeply into our space, into our chair, wherever we may be, let the exhale just settle you down into where you are. And as you gently breathe and feel yourself just relaxing into your body, you allow yourself to go inside your mind to one of your favorite places as a child, he used to play. As you take the next few exhales, you just easily and simply go there to your favorite place you used to play as a child. Maybe it's the playground. Maybe it's your friend's house. Maybe it's the backyard. Maybe it's with a, a particular toy. Just take a few moments to allow yourself to go to that favorite place with that favorite object and observe yourself. As you gently breathe with compassion, 
observe yourself with openness. This young you is playing and completely absorbed, enjoying and having fun. As you observe yourself, enjoying and playing with your favorite thing, Allow yourself to just connect to that spontaneity and pure absorption of the task at hand, the task of having fun, being playful and enjoying without a care in the world. Take a few moments to just breathe that in as you gently observe yourself. As you observe this scene, allow yourself to take a look around. What's around you? Who's around you? As you observe this young self with compassion and warmth, open yourself up, open your heart. Is there a message this young self has for you? In the next few breaths, listen carefully. Your young self takes a moment away from their fun and enjoyable tasks and looks up. Look deeply into their eyes. Allow the message that they have for you to just just come easily and simply into your being. Allow it to be planted like a small seed in your heart. A message of joy and best intentions for you as a young person in a happy moment. As you take the next few breaths, observing this wonderful scene and taking the message with you, you allow yourself, like a seed, to just simply grow effortlessly and simply back into who you are now, to the current age you are now. And as you miraculously grow in this simple journey of growth, you take with you the beautiful lesson and transformation of joy, playfulness, innocence, complete abandon of happiness that you had in that moment as a playful child. You bring that with you as you grow up into your current age right now with a few simple breaths. And as you suddenly find yourself at your current age inside your body, take a few moments to go inside yourself and reflect on the beautiful seed that was planted in your heart by your younger self. See what magic resides there and allow it to unfold in the coming days and weeks to bring you more joy and self-discovery of the things that bring you complete happiness and that make your soul sing so that you can bring this understanding into your daily life. As you now breathe yourself in your seat, and how you're currently positioned, you just allow yourself to take a few breaths, coming back into yourself, feeling yourself centered and back into the room as you gently open your eyes and you return to the space, fully present, fully joyful, back in the room. I'll now take a moment to hear your feedback, Dan, about that journey. Yeah, thank you, Leah. I really, I really enjoyed that journey, and I think our, uh, I know our participants will too. I found myself in a place of often going back to my imagination, which was when I was about oh, maybe four years old, maybe five. My favorite place to play was in a mound of dirt. If I didn't have a mound of dirt in our house, I'd go and find a mound of dirt. And I mean like at least two or three or four feet high, just dirt. And back in the day, 
<clears throat> we had things what we that were called tinker toys, which were basically metal trucks and cars and whatever. I think they were from England, actually. And um, and I had a few of these, not a lot, but a few. Um, and I, if, I, if I often could find a mound of dirt near a construction site or something being, you know, constructed or destructed, which turned out to be an important analogy because my most fun times was to make stuff, create hills, little towns, little villages and roads, move the vehicles around. And there was one particular day, I can't remember exactly when or where, of course, in which I realized that after I built something, I would destroy it. And at first I was like, oh, well, that's not very nice or good. I was taught to be a good boy. But then I suddenly had the insight, even as a young boy, I said, no, no, no. If you don't destroy that little village you just made, you can't create another one. Oh, I'm destroying it so I can, whatever my language was at the time, recreate it. And that's just the moment I went back to. Um, and, and, of course, it has its own lesson in it. <laughs> but the way you guided us, Leah, which I really appreciate, in that moment where the child talks to you, so to speak, as the adult was, was very special for me. And I'm feeling really, really good about it now. My body's feeling alive and energized and um, just, just terrific. My inner child looked back at me and the message was very clear. It was crystal clear. The message was, you can be joyous where the things around you are constructed or destructed. Because I experienced that child. I was always joyous doing that, whether it was any moment. Now, when I apply it to my current life, where things are being constructed and destructed out around me <laughs> in the mound of the earth, so to speak, it's a really, really helpful message for me because there are moments in which, on the destruction side, I despair or get despondent or upset like a lot of us do. Um, but actually, no, my child, inner child reminded me, and I'm so grateful, Leah, that I know the experience of joy on however external things are, constructing, destructing. Those are the natural rhythms of life that this young child was just imitating easily. Uh, and now he's communicating me back across the decades that I know how to be joyous and therefore resilient to whether things are constructing or destructing in a particular moment, week, month, or year. So thank you so much. A really, really powerful journey for me. Thank you for that insight, Dan. That's wonderful. And I think part of the process of growing up quickly with that insight and message, uh, if you receive the insight immediately or if it will come to you over time for those listening, I think it's really valuable that it's something that will resonate with us and that we can actually transform a perception or an understanding based on this type of message in real time. So just quickly growing up, as we imagined, we can actually grow up with a new insight that we didn't have before. So I think that uh, your explanation and your, your, your comments about the journey are really, really relevant. So thank you. Yeah, you're more than welcome, Leah. You know, it's another comment I want to make about it. <clears throat> I was very aware of that when I was going back to that time and space, I was also redoing it. Because you remember that as a child, I had a lingering kind of, gee, I shouldn't be destroying things. But once it was placed in the context of, you're just being joyous, whatever that little village looks like or doesn't, whether the cars are turned upside down or the dirt is all over your face, it just, it redid that moment for me. It, you know, we when we re revisit the so-called past, it redoes the so-called past. And so I also have that subtext that uh, even made it easier for young Danny, which is what I used to be called, to not worry about turning the cars upside down and destroying that part of the hill. And I had a glimpse of that as a young child, but I feel like I just more completely redid it as an adult now. That's fantastic. And I think that really speaks to the power of childhood memories and the power of childhood journeys that Sometimes even immediately after the journey itself, we don't really realize how deep the insight went. And uh, I think this is something that um, it can be profound and unfold over time as we allow um, insights, even in a brief journey, to really deepen and soften our hearts.
So Dan, one of the key questions is how do you do a journey? Journeys are something that are happening spontaneously, like we've talked about. But can you tell me more about how you learn how to do a journey? It's a great question, Lee, and I guess I would unpack it this way. Um, most of our listeners today are, and audience participations, course participants, are already some kind of healer or what coach, etc. And so I'm sure they know a bit of what I'm going to say. So if you already know how to do this, forgive me for some of it. But everyone has in their life some moment of high flow, some place, could be music, could be dancing, could be athletics, could be loving your child, playing with your pet, watching a sunrise. Everyone has something, and if we're lucky and blessed, we have more than one something. And in those moments, understanding what's happening to your body, reflecting on your physiology and your emotions, are very important because the mind is not in control, the mind chatter is not there. Something is drawing us out to our larger self, to our higher flow state, to, to our state that's capable of channeling or, or transmitting, as we, you and I might call it, Leah. And so for, for the course participants, if you already know how to do this, that's fantastic. Hopefully this will, will amplify it. But if you're not certain and not sure you can do it, think about moments where you already do it naturally, where your body shifts suddenly, your posture adjusts, your breathing will get deeper. It's a good it's a good signal. And you can invoke it. You can invoke a higher state in your own being by paying attention to your posture, right? By making sure your breathing shifts from shallow to deep. By perhaps recreating in your mind a moment or moments in your life that are already high flow. Someone you love, some place you love being, some happy memory. You know, the brain doesn't really know the difference between a so-called memory and imagination and so-called reality. You can invoke yourself into, at first, a quiet, calmer, less stressful space, and then even to a deeper space as you practice it. So I'm going to presume that our, our course participants have their own practices of some kind, Leah, but they're all going to be in a spectrum of how deep is their practice, how consistent is it, how long have they been doing it. Obviously, the deeper it is, the longer you do it, uh, the, the more you can, can pull this off. So here's the way I think about it. I'd be interested in your response, Leah. It's my responsibility to take on the practice of centering myself and being focused and relaxed so that when a topic emerges and the journey starts, I am fully present, at least as much as possible in that given moment and that given day. Absolutely, Dan. I think that's really a great way of describing it. And and for me, that's a very similar feeling when I'm giving a journey or teaching a class. I think for the listeners today, what would be an interesting uh, approach to this for the course itself would be to do some self-observation. And this is a little bit of homework to reflect on. I would invite you in your meditation or regular practice, or if you're someone who does journaling, would be to really take note over the next week of the areas in your life that you really enjoy, that you're extremely passionate about. As Dan mentioned earlier, there's many areas where you just feel things are flowing and happening perfectly. It could be when you're gardening, when you're going for a run, when you're in nature, whatever that may be that you really enjoy and are passionate about. Take the next week to really take note of that. And as Dan said, you might want to make a a self-observation about how your body, your physiology is responding in those times. And this is a great way to do a stepwise process to be more self-aware of when you're in a flow state and when you're not. And it can help you also to just, in your daily life, to be more aware of things you don't like as well when your body is tense versus when you're doing things you enjoy and you're really flowing in the moment and your body is relaxed and your breathing is deeper. It's great advice, Lee, and, and really good to uh, to set up a, an observation and a practice over the next few weeks or so. You know, and it, there's an irony in this and there's a paradox in this, right? It, I would say this as a definitive rule, and there are a few definitive rules in my life. If you're in a bad state, 
don't lead a journey. <laughs> okay? If you're tense and upset and confused and angry or anything like that, that is exactly the wrong time. And, and you have to be honest with yourself or your clients in the moment to say, you know, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm just not in the space to do that right now. Or if you're in a recording studio or however you're going to work. But there's another irony to this. There are lots of moments in our lives that are highly stressful, right? And ironically, the skills we learn in getting ready for a journey and doing a journey can help us in the most stressful moments in our lives. So first of all, I'm saying don't give a journey, either live or recorded, if you're in a stressed out space. But secondly, I'm saying if you're in a stressed out space, use the same skills. Look at your breathing. See if you can shift your breathing. Imagine you were trying to give a journey. Because what happens is we know in the physiology of stress now that even just a lone change in your breathing from shallow to deep starts to change not only many elements of your physiology, but in particular your biochemical cascade. What hormones are being released? Are they the hormones of fear, right, and, and, and stress and, and the dinosaur fight or flight, or are they more helpful hormones? So as the flip side of this practice and learning to get better and better at it is attend to your own stress management and use the skills you're learning in this course and in similar courses for your own moments of stress in your own life. Absolutely. And this coupled with taking an observational practice over the next few weeks, like we mentioned as part of the of the coursework, is taking the different journeys and making notes about how you feel, what happens, what your observations and experiences were over time, and also self-observation in regards to what you enjoy, when you're in flow, and like Dan said, when you're not in flow. So by doing this and taking the time to really make note of it and, and personally uh, catching yourself when you're in flow and personally catching yourself when you're not in flow. This is actually a very powerful practice to become much more self-aware and allow you to switch states much more quickly. Well said, Leah. You know, when I was training in Aikido, there was a moment in which I had this f flash of insight, which I really didn't want to have because it, my mind rebelled at it. And it was just a moment where after a couple of years on the dojo, I said to my sensei, my teacher, wait a minute, wait a minute, are you telling me with my attention and intention, you want me to head right into the middle of where I'm most fearful? And he said, that's absolutely what I'm telling you. And I was like gobsmacked. I was like, oh my God, really? Can I do that? But I want to translate that story to, you know, if you're a personal growth practitioner or a coach, or, you know, a yoga instructor or acupuncturist, whatever, whatever you're doing or whatever you want to be doing, that's a really useful skill to take that which you're most fearful of and see if you can transform it. And you'll see when you look at the inventory of our journeys, there are many journeys about transforming fear or transforming such and such. So that the, you know, in Aikido, it's called take the hit as a gift. And it doesn't mean be a victim. It means if life sucks in a moment or is hard for you or really difficult, it happens for all of us and our family and our friends. How do you turn that into a learning moment? How do you transform that? And some of these skills we're talking about here will help you do that. The power of group sharing. I wonder, Leah, whether we shouldn't now talk a bit about sharing and the power of group sharing. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So you understand if you've looked at our materials and, you know, obviously made the decision to take this course that it's not just about solo meditations. Right? As you've heard in examples of, of Leah and I sh giving journeys and sharing our experience as the journey listener, this is a cr critical part of this methodology. We're very happy that there's many, many successful and vibrant and wonderful solo journeys out there in, in, in meditation apps, millions of people using them. We think it's fantastic. But the majority of that experience is solo. And so at the one time while we're connecting to the universe or our god or our goddess or, or whatever the meditation is about, our bodies, etc., we're socially usually alone if we're online. And so there's a digital loneliness, as we talked about earlier, that comes about in sort of paradoxical moments like that. And what we're calling is, what we're calling the difference 
of approach here is social meditation. People listening to a journey together, live or recorded, and then sharing right after that, just like you might do if you were working small groups and face-to-face. When we do that, something special happens. You know this if you've ever done it face-to-face or even in your own Zoom or, or Skype groups. Something happens. It's easier to meditate in a group and it's easier to share authentically and deeply in a group because that space is at least somewhat sacred. And we found this over the years. We've been experimenting with this. It happens all the time that people want to share, in most cases, not all cases, and want to share something really important to them that just happened in their journey, whether it's an insight like I just had or whether it's a feeling in their body or emotions or how it might connect to something they're going to do tomorrow. People share in a wide range of ways. And so this is where we're applying some of the uh, new science to this, which is to say we believe this is what scientists call the shared biofield. And, and people used to think, well, you can only have biofields interacting physically face-to-face. And, and now the you know, science is going beyond that and saying, no, nah, we think maybe the biofield exists beyond just physical reality and therefore it can translate across time and space. So I'm sitting in one space. Lee is sitting in another country, actually. Somebody else is sitting in another place. But if we're sharing even online and live, something special happens something that we call the shared biofield. And this enables people to do several things. One, have a little better memory. We all have funny memory coming out of meditations. But if we're going to speak about it or be asked to consider speaking about it, when we speak about it, it integrates it more into our psyche and our personalities. Sometimes you don't even remember half an hour later what happened in meditation. But if you speak about it right away, if you want to, you don't have to, it's, it's easy to remember and integrate into ourselves. And secondly, if you're deeply, carefully listening to another, you'll often get insights from them. And they'll often have similar insights to yours, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the group sharing part of, of what we do has turned out to be way more than I ever expected it to be or know it to be. Um, it just turns out to be really, really helpful and a wonderful experience. And Lee, I wonder what your comments are on the sharing idea. Actually, Dan, I think it's it's perfectly said. And what I've experienced as well is is both through group sharing the Wakuri method, and also through uh, meditative retreats and uh, experiences on yoga retreats, etc. Whenever you're in a group um, and the actual experience of meditation occurs, or a a sacred space like a like a journey, it actually is an exponentiator. So. The more people you have and the greater the intent, it, the more that experience is, is exponential and it has a greater potential for all those involved. So often it's the idea of it takes a village to, to raise a child. In this case, it takes a village or many people to have the deepest insights because we're all collectively participating in that through this shared biofield, as Dan described and enabling it to be much deeper, generating new ways of thinking and greater openness for whatever insight may occur. I agree, uh, Lee. And another term I sometimes uh, experience is amplification. It's, it's very similar to exponential, right? It amplifies <clears throat> the truth of what is. It amplifies the sensations in your body. And, you know, let's be clear about this. This is the, the only part of of uh, this that's innovative is taking it online, allowing it to be digital, right? The ancients have been, you know, getting us to meet in group and group practices for centuries, right? And 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 happily, many people are doing that now in the 21st century where they can geographically or time-wise, but not everybody can, you know, get to a place geographically or afford a course, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is part of democratizing spirituality to say, well, if you can't, time-wise, geographically, financially do that, here's another alternative. So we can see this whole group sharing thing going into many different variations. In fact, we have plans to make sure, whether it's through Zoom or Skype or other technologies that are emerging, to have hundreds, if not thousands of people listen to a journey and then go into small groups. We think for now that the group sharing has to be small just in terms of time and being respected and listened. What is small, we don't know yet, but 
I remember one group sharing we did with over 12 people, and there just wasn't enough time for everybody to be able to share and be heard. So our current thinking, it may evolve, is we can have large, whatever large may be, people listening to the same journey and then breaking into small groups, which um, Zoom and others allow you to do uh, in a digital way. But I think the main point I want to leave people with is we're beginning to discover that we're all connected. What if that were true all the time? What if it was true that we're actually all connected all the time, but we just didn't know and we forgot? And if it's even possible that we're all connected energetically all the time to the biofields or whatever it is, we're simply learning to remember that as a society and as humanity. And I say simply because it's not that hard to do once you do it, and then it's profound once you start to feel that. And so think of the group sharing as another glimpse into what may be the actual nature of our relationships just waiting to be realized and to access that potential. One of the interesting things about the Wake Up Curious approach in the so-called Wakuri method is that it's very different than most other methodologies. And one of the primary differences is the power of group sharing. We all know, those of you that are already meditators, that it's much easier to meditate in a group face-to-face. -face. Nobody really says why or knows why. We just know. We can feel it in our bodies. We can feel it in the amplification of the field and the energy. It's easier. It's stronger. Do you agree with that statement, Leah? Absolutely. Uh, for me, part of the magic, actually, that happens in a Wakuri journey is about the sharing. Not only because you're in a group and you're allowing the collective energy to take that journey to a new place, but also because the insights that happen when you listen to others deeply and you reflect back on what others' experience is in comparison to your own, it really brings a whole new richness and a whole new level to the outcome of the journey that you have discovered in just the instant situation. Just in the moment, it gives a whole new dimension to that, not only your own discovery, but listening to someone else's and then reflecting back about how that feels for you. You know, that matches my experience. It's almost as if when we end up speaking, we're speaking to the needs and the moment of the group itself, not just our own. And there is a magic in that. So in the case of the Wakari method, what we've done is create the cyber or digital equivalent as if you were sitting in a room with friends or strangers meditating. We sometimes call it just for fun, cyber sangha, sangha being the, the Buddhist name for, for sacred group meetings. It's a community, even if it's temporary, or even if it's ephemeral. And in that temporary ephemeral sharing, what we found is amazing. People go deep and authentic and vulnerable very quickly. Not always, you don't even have to share if you don't want to. And of course, we're very aware that people are in the afterglow of the transmission and the journey, so they're not quite back to so-called ordinary reality. And that's very deliberate on our part, because we want to see what happens and how you can communicate and what it means to share in the group in that still somewhat transmissive space. You could, in a sense, say that the group is transmitting amongst themselves. And you can think about this as any other kind of group you've been in that got real and relaxed and open and honest and vulnerable uh, and, and something important happened in terms of the conversation or the sharing or in a, in a good family meeting as compared to the other family meetings. So there's lots of analogies here. The main point, and we wish you to understand, is that this is not solo meditation. This is meditation you listen to with at least one other and perhaps more two or three seems to be optimal, three or four, and then you talk about it. You talk about how's your body feeling if you want to, how are your emotions, right? What are your thoughts? You do kind of a scan report if that's your inclination or if you had an insight, and some people do, even that quickly, they'll share an insight. 
And sometimes people just share sort of vague, sort of general, hmm, I'm feeling better, or my body's more relaxed. And there's no right or wrong in the sharing. It's whatever arises for that person. And sometimes someone in the group may comment. But the most important thing, of course, is that everyone gets heard and gets seen, both literally and figuratively. Everyone has an opportunity to speak. Everyone has an opportunity to listen deeply. And everyone has an opportunity, perhaps, to comment. And it's not unusual to find people making similar comments. Oh, that happened for you too. Gee, that happened for me. And so it's all kinds of interesting things. We've done hundreds of these sharings now that happen among small groups. And we're happy that uh, you're going to be experimenting with that soon on your own. Exactly. And what I think is really special about this type of experience is that it brings people together. So even though you may be doing a journey with people you don't know, you've never met before, you just come together for this brief journey. What's really interesting is how the group cohesion can occur in the course of a very short journey that you can go from the start to the finish and then have a discussion and feel a deep connection with others based on the insights and the journey that you mutually took together. So this is something that brings us closer to others, but it also brings us as a collective more aware of the broader experience and the oneness that we can all share through the power of the meditative journey and the Wakuri method. So I think it's really an exciting way for us to experience meditation, not alone, but in community. And whether or not we're far apart, we can do that in a way that's really simple and really effective and, and can actually generate some great and deep insights in just a simple way because you've seen others experience, you've shared your own, and then it can be a wonderful reflection for yourself. Thank you for those really important comments. You know, I think we might have said earlier, we consider... Uh, as an organization, that the biggest problem facing at least the Western world is existential loneliness. And you can unfortunately see this in the rise of what are called deaths of despair, addiction, suicides, PTSD, et cetera, et cetera. And those are, up on, the, those are on the rise, as we might have commented on before. Well, we want to be a part of helping to end loneliness. It's why our vision statement is deeper connections with self, others, and the universe. So Leah's absolutely right. She's completely right on this. The group sharing is not just an interesting little trick or thing you might do. It's much more than that. You know, we thought it uh, understandable but ironic that almost all the meditation apps that are out there that, you know, that are just strictly online, you're doing solo. And that's fine. We honor that. And I do some of those. Some of my journeys and our journeys are there. But think about it. If meditating together is easier and stronger and more helpful and socially more connecting, as Leah has said, we don't have to just meditate on our own, on an app or, or in our room. So think about this and think about it in your own journey. Think about what your groups and cohesions and social engagements are. And understand that this is a complete innovation. This is new. It doesn't exist in the marketplace yet. And of course, we're offering it to you to learn, to hopefully be excited by it, to benefit from it in your practice and in your businesses in ways as yet uh, unimagined. Absolutely. And as we were talking about uh, the impact of the collective and the community is something really special because often it brings insights that we didn't actually anticipate beforehand. So in a community, when a, a journey is happening, you can actually find that the journey itself is responding dynamically in a very spontaneous and uh, you know, beneficial way for others because it's actually addressing people's bigger picture needs 
because of the transmissive nature of the journey itself, if we're in flow and allowing that journey to come through, often it's answering unasked questions before we ask them. So in essence, we receive a journey and then we realize, my goodness, the insight I had is something that's been puzzling me for many months. And here it is in this journey. And wow, it just happened right now. So as we connect with others virtually in the community and through this journey approach, it enables this whole connection of our collective biofields so that we are connecting to the energy of others, responding to that in a very intuitive way, and therefore receiving, in many cases, what we actually were looking for at a bigger picture level without actually realizing it. So suddenly, oh, I was looking for the answer to that question, and there it is. So it's a very dynamic process, but in community, I believe that it makes it much stronger as a team and as a group. I agree with you. Uh, that, that is my experience as well. Exploring the power of awe. Let's move on to the notion of exploring the power of awe. You know, this is an important part of the Curry method that every journey, we hope, has a moment in it where something happens that is really beyond language. That was how I would describe the experience of awe for myself, and perhaps for you as a, as a listener. Could be nature, could be a moment of parenting, it could be anything in the world where you've suddenly been stunned into silence and you're just full of this ineffable phrase, awe. Now, it's not that awe can not have an intentionality behind it or has to be accidental. That can happen too. But you intend to go out and watch the sunset. You've set an intention. You're looking for beauty, right? But you can turn a corner and not expect a flower that's suddenly there beneath your feet blooming you didn't even know existed and also have a moment of awe. So sometimes moments of awe are a result of intentionality. Gee, we had an awesome discussion because we tried too hard and be pay attention and be focused with one another. Or, oh my goodness, we didn't even know where this country road went, and now look at this view. Awe seems to be something that is kinesthetic and beyond thought, although it obviously can include thought, mostly gratitude and appreciation, and it certainly brings up emotions. And I wonder, Lee, what your comments might be on the power of awe. Absolutely. I think that awe or wonder, or the speechless moment that has no words is something that occurs when we least expect it. And often, it's so simple that it takes our breath away and it touches us emotionally. For example, you feel it in your heart, you feel it in your body, you just suddenly stop and pause. And awe is something that it's so hard to articulate because each and every one of us experiences it in our own way. But those moments of wonder and delight that are beyond us, that just occur spontaneously, I believe they have a huge impact for us spiritually because they have an ability to shift us to new ways of thinking by generating greater appreciation by allowing us to be more open to our universe and allowing us to enable new possibilities within ourselves by simply enjoying nature or seeing the wonder of, of an insight that just occurs from someone else giving you information that is long sought after. This type of thing can happen quite unexpectedly. So by being open to that, it can allow us to shift in a deep way very quickly and very simply. Thank you, Leah. And let me add another dimension to awe. <clears throat> you know, sometimes I call that sacred silence. Usually we're 
awestruck and speechless, as you said. But what I found for myself and sometimes in others is that that seems to be a doorway, that sacred silence that comes with awe or wonder into the oneness of all things. And we, in a sense, then are tapping in, perhaps very briefly, perhaps for a long time, into our true connectivity to the entire universe, the planet, other humans, etc. And it may be sub rosa, it may be not conscious, because we're thinking about the sunset or whatever the subject matter might be, but there's a certain quality, a certain vibrational tone in that moment of awe or wonder that I think is a doorway to the center of the universe. That's a really great insight, Dan. And I think awe is a doorway, and it's also a huge learning. So let us use this moment of awe as something that we can mark in our lives. We can also take this as an opportunity for us to reflect. So simply, as we move through this course, you've been taking different notes about your experiences, about your perceptions of the different journeys, it's also very important to take note in your own life when moments of awe are happening. If a moment of awe, as you experience it in a Wakuri journey as part of this course, really touches you, make note of it, either if you're journaling or if you have your own regular practice. Keep note of these things so that you can then return to them and use them as learning opportunities. Because if you know, for example, that you have your most moments of awe in nature, or if it happens to be by observing at the animal kingdom and looking at the birds or other animals and being very connected to that, or for example, if you receive those moments of awe spontaneously in your day-to-day -day life from time to time, take note of it so that you can then use those moments as triggers and reflection points for your ongoing deepening of your practice. Thank you, Leah, for uh, reminding people that there is homework to do in this course. And throughout this process, Leah is pointing that out to you and encouraging you. You don't just listen and then do nothing until the next time you listen. It will greatly enhance your experience. You know, we have many, many journeys. We've recorded over 350. And there's a few of them that you get to listen to in this course. Some we've done live, some are pre-recorded. So when you're ready, take a moment and just get ready to listen to this next journey. We hope that every journey has a moment of awe. You decide for yourself as you prepare. What is transmission? Leah, let's now move on to a question we get all the time, you and I, I'm sure, and others in our group. We use the word transmission, and we say that our journeys are transmissive. And I can't tell you how many people say to me, okay, Dan, but what is the transmission? So let's explore that topic, if we might. Absolutely. I think it's a great topic, Dan, and I think um, transmission as a concept is something that can be easily misunderstood. And I think we can be as simple as possible in that transmission is simply getting out of our own way and allowing the flow and the wisdom that is already part of ourselves from the universe to just come through us. You know, getting out of our own way is, um, you know, we've all heard that phrase many times, and some people say, well, how do you do that? And if you're going to become a journey guide, it's really important that you understand how to prepare to be transmissive, to give a transmissive journey. We've talked uh, earlier about the whole idea of spontaneity and, and moments of flow in your own life, and we want to build on that now. So here's some early suggestions for you. And of course, you can find your own best ways as well. These are just things that seem to work for us. Before I start a journey, I always attend to my breathing. Is it deep? Is it shallow? How quiet am I? 
I try, of course, to be in a very quiet surrounding, hopefully uninterrupted, so your physical environment's important. But mostly I'm paying attention to my physical body. I may have had a stressful day, I may have had a good mood, how's my diet been, and my exercise, it's just kind of a check-in moment. And as I think I said earlier under spontaneity, if, if, you're, if you're getting negatives on all that checking in, don't do a journey. It doesn't matter if you schedule something live or to record something, it's not going to work very well. At least that's my advice and my experience. But you can also invoke yourself. If you really have a client in need that you want to do a live journey for, or you've committed to recording things with, you know, costs involved and timetables involved, unless you're really, really stressed, you can usually have the skill, most of you already have these skills, to get centered, to get calm. Not only pay attention to your breathing, but that will change your biochemical cascade, and that will change your heart rate. So just take a moment now. Try it now. Just look at your breath. Observe it. Is it shallow or deep? We all start our journeys by saying, take a nice couple of deep breaths or something equivalent. It's not accidental. So you, as the journey guide, can do that before you start the journey. Just slightly ahead of the listener. Check in now. Is your monkey mind going crazy? Do you know how to still it? How's the rest of your body feeling? Are you comfortable in your posture? And of course, you all have your own techniques for being centered and getting into flow. So this is the place to use them. You know, it doesn't take Lee and I long to prepare to give a journey, but we're practiced at it. And if you are, then you know exactly what we're talking about. And if you're not quite yet, use your skills. Develop some new ones. I love giving journeys, and one of the reasons I love giving journeys is I have to come into my center and be present. And so it becomes a part of my practice, not just my work. It's part of my practice to get ready for a journey and then to deliver a journey and perhaps facilitate a sharing. Leah, how about you? How do you prepare before you give a journey? For me, it's very similar. I look at my body. I look at my posture. I also look at my breath. Additionally, the other thing I check in before I uh, do a transmissive journey is about my intention. For me, that's one of the quickest ways to tap in to the higher aspect of myself is just really sending out that highest intention for what I'm about to do. And in doing so, just sort of tapping in in sequence, as Dan mentioned, to my breath, my body, my posture, right after I've asked and really reflected on my intention. And then I move through the next items on the checklist of how to settle myself into flow. So very similar a process. And the more you do it, the more it becomes really habitual and easy to do, which is also a great technique anyway, before you do a journey and, and actually participate in a journey that, that we are walking through as part of this course. So one thing I'd, I'd encourage you to do is, is in, from a take-home perspective, is really reflecting on, based on your own practice and your own experience, what works best for you and in what order. So give that a try at home. Take note of it. How do you get settled in before you do a journey, before you do your own personal practice or meditation? And, and just explore what works best. Do you start with the body? Do you start with the breath? Do you start with intention? Do you start with posture? And just refine on your own over time the sequence that works best for you so that it can become almost a spontaneous stepwise process for you to just quickly move through so that you can easily settle in and be ready. I thank you, Lee, and I want to pick up on one point in particular, which is the idea of intentionality. Something that I do almost automatically now is I either know my audience, if it's an individual or a certain group, or if we're recording for general usage, I tune in in my imagination 
to the listeners that will listen to this in the so-called future. So part of my intentionality is to connect, connect energetically with those who will be listening to this journey. And so I recommend that to you. Now, of course, it's important to understand, and I hope people already know this, but in case you don't, transmission is not a new concept. It's not an invention from us. It's an ancient, ancient concept. If you go back through all the literature across all the major religions and their mystical cores and all the wisdom traditions, it doesn't matter what culture and almost what century. The leaders, the gurus, the people who know about these things will, will say, they will say in their conversations that have been transcribed or translated that they're transmitting. They will actually say it. And there isn't usually a lot of discussion about that. It, there's, it's kind of an of course thing. Of course they're transmitting. So transmission is hardly a new concept. It's an ancient concept. In fact, just so you could uh, perhaps enjoy that, we're going to do a journey to ancient transmissions. So let's take a moment to just be with ourselves, taking a few deep breaths to simply and easily center. As we feel our bodies relax, we feel ourselves moving simply into a state of flow as we join each other on a journey to the source of ancient transmissions. As you take the next few breaths, with each exhalation, allow yourself to further settle into your body. As you settle, imagine you're simply floating through time and space to the ancient origins, ancient wisdom traditions. Simply and easily, you're floating through time and space, back in time to when some of the great teachers brought wisdom to the planet. As you exhale and settle, you notice that your voyage has stopped. As you observe where you are, you take a look around. Incredibly so, you find yourself in the middle of a temple. The sun is just rising. It's early in the morning. There are large stone pillars all around you. You're in the sacred center of an ancient temple. The sun is rising and you're sitting together with a great teacher. Take the next few moments to breathe and observe your surroundings. Notice how you feel, notice what's around you. As you take note of this space, open yourself up to the teachings that you're receiving in the moment in this ancient center of wisdom. As you breathe in the mystery, you realize you're being taught something wondrous and new as you're just absorbing the knowledge simply and easily. And now go a little deeper into that experience. Allow yourself sitting in this room with this great teacher to comprehend and apperceive, as the phrase might be, that he or she has created a field of energy, a field of light, a field of love. They call it somewhat different things. And you can feel it. In the modern era, it makes me think of a Dalai Lama or Nelson Mandela, how you could feel their presence viscerally in your body. This is a transmission. It may or may not have lectures or words or prayers or chants associated with it. It really lives in the silence of an energetic exchange. Feel this great teacher now. We 
ramping up the power and the energy, whether he or she in their tradition is saying much at all. Often they're very silent. Just be silent for a moment and feel the transmission in your being, your heart, your mind, your body. And of course, if you're feeling it, so are all the other students around in this great room. And if they're all feeling it, it amplifies back to the master. And there's an energetic biofeedback loop that amplifies the entire moment for you and for everyone. Now hold that feeling and just imagine that there are many other great teachers all around the planet, right in this same moment and in the past and in the future to come. So let's imagine there are thousands of great teachers, known and unknown, popular and unpopular, hidden in small groups and caves, thousands in an arena, past and future, and feel the vibratory transmission of the wisdom of the ancients surrounding the entire planet and all of humanity and all of its creatures. Just take a moment. And if we're living, so to speak, in a sea of transmissions, we have the great and wonderful and awesome privilege and opportunity to participate in that and to share in that. So now imagine yourself as a leader and a teacher, if you're not already, transmitting to those you care for, family, friends, clients, neighborhood, however you characterize your service in the world, whatever it's called or named or whatever it's architecture, pay attention now to the beauty and strength of the transmission of universal light, consciousness. For now, slowly, with practice, you are becoming the master. And when you're ready, give thanks. Go back into the room and have a wonderful day. Journeys that transform negatives. Okay, and uh, Leah, why don't you start this one instead of me? Um, and... Um, you know, of course, the thought behind it is all of our journeys that are things uh, like journey to the transformation of fear, a journey to the healing of trauma. You know, we take something that is negative, uh, and those kinds of journeys, just like a healer would do, you, it, it's, it's a little bit tricky because you enter into the trauma or the fear or whatever the subject is, and you, just like a, a massage therapist or an energy healer matches your breathing where it is first and then takes you to her breathing, you actually match the vibration of the trauma or the fear first. So there's a moment of, ah, what are we doing, <laughs> right? And, and then you go beyond that. And so it's, a, it's a, a really important process given what our culture is going through right now. So now what I'd like to talk next about, Dan, is about the journeys that have an opportunity for us to change. These journeys can really transform negatives. So many times when we go on a journey, we may have experienced these wonderful, fantastical experiences that are full of awe and joy, and these are wonderful. But what's also very important is journeys that can transform. And these types of journeys can go deep into places where we're afraid, deep into places where we have a lot of fear, places where we really don't want to go. So sometimes when we go on a journey that goes into a place that we're afraid of, maybe it's a childhood trauma, maybe it's a place, a phobia or a fear that we may have, maybe it's something that has happened in our lives and that we're quite uncomfortable with on an ongoing basis, 
whatever it may be, when we go into these journeys, it can be a little bit uncomfortable because we actually have to go in inside ourselves and touch a place that just doesn't feel so great. But in doing so and allowing ourselves to be in flow in those places, we can actually enable ourselves through simple breathing and presence in the moment. We can actually allow that transformation to take place because we faced the fear. We faced that place of discomfort within us and held a space for it. And in that breathing and in that presence of that fearful place, we can let it transform. And often this happens really naturally as part of the transformative journey. So what's really amazing about these brief journeys is that they don't always need to be into a natural and wondrous place. They can also be into places that challenge us and give us a little bit of discomfort. But in doing those journeys, we also have a huge opportunity to grow. You know, Aaliyah, uh, it's, um, it's true. Everything you say is true. I have a number of clients that come to me first because they're under stress um, or discomfort or, or fear or anywhere along that spectrum. And of course, they want to get rid of that discomfort or fear or stress, understandably. And what I've learned over the years of this kind of practice from my mentors and my, my own experimenting is exactly what you said. Fears, stresses, anxieties actually need to be walked right into the middle of. And it seems counterintuitive. Wait a minute, I don't want to feel this feeling. You're telling me to feel it more. But there is a way in which that walking into the middle of something changes something. In other words, fear, stress, anxiety can become doorways for learning and insights and healing is what I heard you say. And thank God, you know, that's really a blessing. Right? If we were just here to suffer, then we would never learn anything from those things. And of course, when we learn from them, they start to heal. And when we heal from them, we start to learn. Both are true. And so the healing process starts with accepting a moment of discomfort or anxiety or stress or, or a shallow or a deep fear or occasional or permanent or chronic and, and doing something different about it, right? And, of course, we hope that the journeys of ours that are about transforming negatives can help someone along, along that way. Absolutely. I think that's a really important uh, insight that we can gain um, by doing a brief journey and walking to the ledge, as it were, of, of a high precipice of our own self, we can actually look over that edge, look into the abyss of what we're afraid of, and actually realize we can go there and we still have a parachute. We're able to go there and we're able to change the experience from one of a negative to one that can actually enable us to heal and be more positive and transformational for us as a process of that journey and a process of moving through it and facing it. You know, you're reminding me of a nightmare I used to have, a recurring nightmare, in which I was running through the forest and stumbling over branches and bumping into trees and rocks and, and some unseen, ununderstood, terrible creature was chasing me. I was running hell-bent for leather through the forest. This dream kept recurring and recurring almost every night for a long while until finally some part of me, I guess, just got sick of it. And I found myself, through my intentionality, going into a lucid dream in which I knew I was dreaming and having the nightmare again. And I was just determined to change the story somehow. And I found myself stumbling into a, an opening in the trees, uh, whereas the forest had been quite thick and all the nightmares and dreams. And it was just an opening. There was a little shaft of light coming in. I just thought, that's it. I'm not to hell with it. I'm not running anymore. Just I'm just staying here to meet whatever that creature monster is. And I looked up, and there was some kind of creature monster leaning on the tree saying, what took you so long? And that was the end of the nightmares. 
So it really is this sort of counterintuitive, well, are you ready to face into whatever you're ready to face or not? And if you're not, it's okay, right? But sometimes when you can face in or guide a client to face into these things, there are those moments of partial tra transformation or, or, or deep transformation. I wonder, Leah, whether you're inclined to lead a journey to the transformation of something or other. Sure. Let us take a moment to settle ourselves and to just take a few deep breaths as we deeply relax in the body. As we take a few deep breaths, allow ourselves with each exhale to just settle more fully into our chairs, into our sitting position. With each exhale, it's as though we're really deeply grounding ourselves. And now as we breathe, I invite you to feel deeply inside your body. Take note of your body as it is right now. So take a few breaths to just scan your body. As you scan your body, you may notice there are places where there's more tension than others. Allow yourself to go to one of the places you may note where there's more tension in your body than the rest of you. This may be in your heart, in your shoulders, in your neck, in your head. Wherever it may be, allow yourself to simply breathe and go to that place. As you breathe in your body, ask yourself to simply go to what is causing the tension inside yourself. What is the source of this tension inside of you? Keep your mind open and your breathing relaxed. And just allow that the first thing that comes to your mind, whatever it may be, could be stress, it could be a circumstance in your life, could be a situation, a relationship, a memory. Whatever it may be, take the next few breaths to just hold that in front of you. Just hold it in front of you. Just like it's completely neutral thing in front of you. It's as if you're inside of the tension that's in your body. You're taking relaxing breaths. You've noticed it. And now you've placed it in front of you, in front of your body. And as you observe neutrally and breathe in a relaxed way, allow your exhalation your exhalation to just simply pass through this tension, whatever this object of tension may be in front of you. As though you're blowing off dust on the surface of a table. Just the next few exhalations, it's as if you're observing the tension, but you're allowing it to dissipate by facing it and looking at it as separate to you. Your breath can simply let it go. As you gently breathe and observe this object, ask if there's any information that is there for you as an insight as you gently breathe and let it go. As you take note of 
this insight and information and you breathe out gently and simply, notice how this tension, now that you've heard it, observed it, breathed into it and listened to it, notice just like the dust easily moves off the top of the table, how this tension in front of you is just simply fading away. So give thanks to this object and give thanks for the lesson it has provided you as you've simply breathed through it. As you bring yourself back, you notice how you feel inside your body feeling more relaxed. As you simply breathe, as you bring yourself back, bring yourself back to where you're sitting, bring yourself back into the room, noticing how you feel, giving thanks for the insight as you come back in the room, fully present. Fully relaxed. Thank you, Leah. I think that was a wonderful journey. And the fact that you let the listener pick their issue or object or item to be healed, so to speak, is really, I think, gets the point across to our participants in this course. You can name a specific, if you wish to, in a live journey or in a recorded journey, if it arises for you or your clients, or you can transform generally. And if I think about the state of our world and all the tra trauma and pressures that everyone is going under now, whatever their circumstances, but especially the, the most oppressed, there's never been a time for a need for more healing than now. And if in some small way our journeys towards healing, transformation of pain or fears or whatever you might call it, contribute, then we're f helping fulfill our mission. And I would invite you to think about creating journeys that serve your community and the needs of your community. It could be your local community. It could be a community of interest. You know, the first time this ever happened for me it was really one of the origin stories of the Recurry Method at Curious Live. It was a group of women, all of whom were um, struggling with cancer. And <clears throat> my job was to run a meditation session with them, and I felt totally inadequate because these one women were extraordinary. There were quite a few of them in the room, and, and they went around the room <clears throat> to check in, and they all gave their stories. And their stories were heart-rendering because some of them were dying and said that. Some of them were blind or going blind. Some of them were recovering, but that was the minority. But their attitude was unbelievably transformative and positive. And I've, here I am, and I wrote a poem about it called uh, Wisdom in the Face of Mortality. So here are these 20 women speaking about their stories, but also speaking about their loved ones and their lives and what they were doing to try and continue to heal and also to live the best life they had, no matter how long they had. And, and they ate, ranged in age from like 20 to 80. It was just unbelievable. And what happened for me was that in their transformational stories, I didn't do anything other than hold space for them and do a little meditation, and then they... And the sharing afterwards blew me away because the light and the energy and the love in the room was palpable. And that was a huge lesson for me as a younger man because it was like, okay, here's women who are right at the coal face, right on the cliff edge, in ways I couldn't even imagine. And yet they're full of vibrancy and humor and love and determination and grit. And it wasn't one voice of self-pity or regret in that room, which maybe was kind of what I was expecting. So that was part of the origin story, was to see that, that people in that state of trauma and despair and fear, and I'm sure all the other things that, that they, I know they were feeling, uh, they called it out, but they called it out in a, in a transformative context, was a, a miracle to me. And uh, 
if that extraordinary group of women can do that, we can surely do our own, you know, smaller, lesser version. Absolutely. I think the insight here for us is to to take these lessons, these profound lessons, and to really bring them in and integrate them. Through a simple, short journey, you too can transform yourself, whatever it is that you're looking to transform. The intention of leaving this journey open is that so at home, you too can proceed through doing this journey a few times. Take it every week or every few days and focus on a different topic. So you can allow yourself to fill in the blank, as it were, of that transformative space, whatever that tension might have been that you observed inside your body. Allow yourself to take a new approach each time. And as you go through these journeys, observe what's happening in your body observe how you feel before and after, and also make notes about how this is for you and how you express it to yourself so that you can learn more about how you're transforming in the areas that you want to focus on as you develop and learn through this course. Thank you, Leah. Uh, As always, good advice. And here's another dimension to this. If you wish to help others heal or transform, In our view, you must be on your own journey to do the same. I don't mean that there's some state of perfection or all healed up, you know, a state that we could somehow accomplish. I don't believe that. But I do know that I must be on my own journey if I dare to presume to help someone else on their journey. First of all, the least it does is help me be more centered and more present, but it also helps me be more compassionate if I understand something more about my own pain and my own growth process that I'm much more likely to to understand and support someone else's. So there's another dimension to that. Journeys that take you to deeper connection with self, others, and the universe. So Leah, our uh, vision statement is deeper connections with self, others, and the universe. And it's not meant to be just a cute phrase. It's meant to be literal. And and what I mean by that is, it's our experience that we already have those deeper connections. They exist. It's not something that needs to be created, although it seems like we're creating it. Perhaps it's more accurate to say we're remembering it or enlivening it or connecting with it again or something like that. But I wonder what your comment is about that phrase uh, in our our vision statement. So for me, this is a really powerful phrase or vision statement because it's kind of the cycle of of how life is and how learning is in terms of spiritual learning because really you have to start with where you are so starting with yourself before you can reach out to others and then of course before you can create create a greater gener- you know generosity and openness for the whole universe so i think This is really a statement that is a great truth, actually, for personal transformation and for spiritual growth in general, but it's also very literal, like you say, in that it is where we start. We start with self, we move to others, and then we ultimately are open to the universe. Uh, Thank you for that. Let me ask you another question, if I might. Why is it, do you think, that if it's true that we all essentially are all deeply connected in all these ways, how is it we forgot? What happened? Well, I think that's a big, big question. Um, I think it could be simply that uh, that was part of the plan uh, that, you know, our good old ego and our world as it is now is, uh, is potentially less connected uh, than in the past. And therefore, it's just sort of a, a big game of distraction that uh, is part of the path that we have so that we can return to ourselves and return to the wisdom that's within us, uh, within this this greater game of distraction that's all around us. So I think that's part of the, the bigger picture, actually, as to why that we're often forgetting that we're connected, uh, is because 
you know, we need reminders. Sometimes we're really busy. We have our lives. We have our jobs. We have obligations. You know, we may have family, friends, you know, people we're caring for. Many, many things in life that are happening in such a fast pace in our in our society nowadays with all the connectivity that we have. And often, even in a day, though we may meditate, we note that from the connection we feel in our in our personal practice to potentially a few hours later as we go through a potentially challenging client meeting or someone who's you know had a really bad day and gotten mad at us, we can note that throughout the day, our connection to ourself or others or the universe can vary very greatly in a, in a given day, given hour. So I think that's part of this entire experience we live as human beings is discovering that we can always return to ourselves. We can always return to our wisdom. And sometimes by doing a regular practice, we can continue to come back to ourselves on a regular basis. And ideally, those moments between when we're connected and when we're not connected become less and less. So we feel a greater connection most of the time. You know, Lee, you're making me think about what I would call two countervailing trends. In other words, people seem to be struggling more than ever and more and more disconnected in many of our cultures and societies. So that's, uh, that's challenging and difficult for everyone. And yet at the same time, there's this great awakening. You know, our book is called Wake Up Curious, right? And wake up to what? It's to wake up to this remembering, this knowledge, this understanding that there is a deeper connection right in our marrow, right in our sinews, right in our, our guts. And so I experienced both of these trends at once, but it seems to be more and more difficulty for people to collaborate and coordinate and get along and build teams and and cooperate in their towns or villages or around the world, indeed. Yet there's a countervailing force, thank goodness, a countervailing force where thousands of people are longing and hungry to wake up or hungry to remember. And of course, if you're a personal growth practitioner or want to be one, they need you, right? They need you urgently and desperately in the best way that you can be present for them as you remember to help them remember as you wake up, to help them wake up. Leah, it seems to be a hard time for much of humanity. More poverty, more starvation, more violence, more divisiveness. And it doesn't matter whether you're in the West or the East or rich com- com- country or poor country. It just seems to be a, a troubled time. Now, maybe every generation says that. But nonetheless, at this particular moment in time, it seems to be challenging out there, which suggests to me that the question of transforming negatives and the healing that could come with it is more important than ever. What do you think is going on? What what do you think this zeitgeist is about? Well, I think that, in fact, the more that we can connect with ourselves, be connected to who we are, and be comfortable with who we are, the more we can connect and be open to others. And in doing so, as we connect with ourselves through journeys, through our meditative practice, through our own self-discovery, the more we can be present for others and the more we can be connected beyond ourselves, right? So for the bigger picture, for all the suffering that's happening in the world, the more that we are able to be who we are, be grounded, you know, be really, really safe in ourselves and have that inner wisdom that we are who we are and and that self-discovery the greater opportunity there is for a deep connection with others through understanding, through insight, through connection, through meditative journeys, through many, many ways that we can just simply heal each other through being connected to ourselves. So it's kind of like a a knock-on effect. You know, the more we are connected to ourselves, the easier it is for us to connect to others and so on beyond ourselves. So it's kind of like contradictory in the environment we're currently in. 
because like you said, it's, it's quite overwhelming, but in the opposite balancing effect, we can actually through our own self enablement and spiritual growth and our own learning, we can actually transform that so we can help the broader universe grow and, and be more stable. So I hear you, Leah. Thank you for that, saying it's time for us to step up and rise up to the occasion rather than shrink from it, and that the first place to do that is interior, our insides, our own growth, our own healing, our own transformation. And and I agree with that. You know, how dare we suggest we can help someone else if we're not helping ourselves first. Again, not in search of perfection, but in search of, of being in our journey and in our process. And, you know, those of you who are participating in this course are are there already some kind of personal growth practitioner or or want to become one, and you probably use the services of someone like yourself. This is part of the rhythm. There are tough times, and maybe there's tough times in every century and every decade. But these times seem particularly tough, all the more need for you and your work and your wisdom and your work on yourself and your work with others. It's more important than ever before. It's not some interesting, trivial hobby. It's a critical contribution to humanity and the planet. I think that's a really important learning through this course, that journeys that we do as part of the homework and part of the the lessons can enable and increase connectivity, so both to ourselves and to others. And I think an important opportunity for us is to identify those moments of connectivity. So it's a really great opportunity to just keep a journal or keep note in your practice of the things that make you feel more connected in the journey itself. So what moments in the journey bring you greater connectivity and greater unification and what things don't do that. And as we can focus on the things that bring us greater connection to ourselves or to others in the reflective communication and sharing after a journey, we can keep a list of these really important insights. And they're very personal to each and every one of us. So what is it that helps you be more connected? It might be simply slowing your breathing. Or it might be simply feeling yourself inside your body. Or it could be taking a moment in nature. Whatever it is, just take the time as you go through this next journey and reflect on the moment of connectivity and connection. And as you do the journeys again and again, and in your life and in your day-to-day experience, take a note about those connections because they can serve you, they can teach you, and they can also help you connect to other people as you continue to learn more about who you are. Thank you, Leah. I think that's going to be very helpful for our participants. So we'd like to do another journey now, related to this topic. And perhaps, Leah, we can do it together. Maybe I'll start and you can finish, if that's okay with you. So let's get ready for a journey. Take a nice couple of deep breaths in your own rhythm, please. And adjust your comf- posture, let me start again, and adjust your posture to be comfortable if you haven't already. And come with us today on a journey to universal mycelium, an exploration of the connective tissue of the universe itself. I want you to imagine that you're floating up above the earth somewhere just on the edge of the atmosphere. You can see the curve of the earth. If it's nighttime, you can see lights. Daytime, you can see the ocean, blue of the ocean and clouds, the white. But you're just kind of hanging out there, looking at our magnificent planet in a way that the astronauts first saw and were struck by. You can pick your altitude a little close in, a little further out, your choice. But as you do that, you could begin to notice out of the corner of your eye something you've never noticed before, which is there seems to be a grid work, 
a tissue, a something vague at first, transparent, but kind of there, overlaying the entire earth. So there's the earth and all of us in it, and all of our creatures and our continents and our oceans, but above it all, at some indeterminate height, there's something else. And there's something else may be the connective tissue of all things. It may be the biofield of the Earth itself, the energy field. We certainly know there's an electromagnetic field, but there seems to be evidence now that there's much more than just electromagnetic. So I want you to feel your way into this something else, this energy field surrounding Mother Earth. Take a moment now. Just dip into it, surrender into it, become a part of it. Perhaps it's lights, perhaps it's spider web-like, you decide. Just feel the waves and patterns of something more than just the earth herself. And as you explore this wondrous network that's all the way around the earth, just guide yourself simply through it and explore it. Note how easily and effortlessly you can just move through this web. Almost like liquid silver, you can simply move easily and quickly from one side of Mother Earth to the other through this wonderful network. Just allow yourself to slip and glide through this amazing network. You can go from the North Pole to the South Pole in one deep breath. And as you look around and explore and discover this wondrous web that is all around the Earth, observe with each new breath how the web itself is receiving information from the universe and also connecting all the planet and all the beings. Just take note and see how that's wondrously and simply happening. And as you take the next few breaths, you just imagine as though you're breathing the web around the earth. You can breathe in rhythm to this wisdom that is a network around the planet. And you can allow that wisdom to simply absorb into your being, absorb into your higher consciousness as you take the next few breaths to just Simply and easily breathe this wondrous and incredible network. This bright and shiny network that is just there with each new breath. As you allow yourself to absorb these insights on a higher level, Give yourself permission for this information and wisdom to unfold in the coming days and weeks as you take a next few breaths, observing the network and slowly separating from this wondrous web that's covering the earth as you allow yourself to float away from this web, giving thanks and gratitude as you slowly float back to your current place, to your current location, to your body that's relaxed and in the chair, as you breathe yourself back to where you are right now, taking the next couple of breaths with gratitude to integrate this wisdom as you come back with thanks, energized, and relaxed into the room. 
What's next? So the question becomes, what's next for you? What's next for all of us? How do we continue to sharpen our skills, grow, heal our wounded parts, serve the communities that we're called to serve? And of course, the real intimate answers to those questions are yours and yours alone. But together, hopefully, we're offering you skills in this course that helps you answer those questions. We certainly hope that you're inspired to continue on to become a journey guide or to start to learn to give your own journeys with your own content. Maybe, maybe just with friends or family or, or maybe with your clients if, uh, if you're ready for that, which is fantastic. And remember that there's no such thing as a bad journey. You can't get this wrong. It's not a test. You're just trying to find a way to communicate that is perhaps beyond what you've done to date or it amplifies what you've already done to date. Think about a journey and a sharing process afterwards as something new, as something that will extend your reach, both in terms of the depth of your relationships with those you wish to, to deepen, uh, and also something that you could replicate more easily than perhaps just doing your work one-on-one. -on -one. And here's the way to think about it, at least the way I think about it. We said a few minutes ago that the world needs you and your skills and your services, all of us. Then the more you reach and or the more deeply you reach people, the better we all are off for that. But it takes self-confidence, right? It takes a certain presumption. It takes a certain kind of expansiveness and, a, and a, a willingness to jump over that cliff to do something new or to do it in an expanded way. We know this, right? And we know sometimes we're all resistant to change as human beings. But as the song said many years ago, the times are changing, so we need to change to catch up with them. Here's a way to think about it. Every change you make in your own being and in your own practice has a huge ripple effect for all of humanity and all of the planet, but especially those closest to you, emotionally and or geographically. So you're already impacting everyone and certain people more than others. Let's see if that impact can be ever more conscious and ever more intentional and ever more full of your wisdom and your light. That's really what the purpose of this methodology is in this course. Leah, I wonder if you want to comment on where our participants might go next. I think one of the ways for the participants of this course to go deeper would be once again to continue with the journeys that they're doing as their work at home and their regular practice and to ask themselves a few different questions. So one of those would be, you know, is my practice regular? So as part of the next steps, it would be really an important reflection to ask themselves, how regular is my practice and how comfortable do I feel with that? And as you reflect on that and you feel much more comfortable over time with all of the journeys that you've done and the course material that you've gone through here, if you're continuing that, those journeys on a regular basis and doing the self-reflection and taking notes for yourself, then the next question might be to ask and reflect on would be really around your intent, around what's your intent for yourself in the future. And like Dan has alluded to, there's just so much possibility for us to grow and learn and to support ourselves and each other and the universe with the greater expansion and expansiveness of new lessons and, and new openings. And so if this is something really affirmative that you re reflect on these different areas as part of your homework with the course, and you realize that you're having a really great regular practice, and this is something you want to deepen. And secondly, if your intent and your vision for yourself is really to, to deepen your practice and to deepen your experience for yourself and to share that with others, then I think it's really a right time. And you'll know within yourself it's really a right time to explore further learning and new courses that you could then take forward and say, 
I want to learn how to give journeys and I want to know how to give this back and create my own content so I can share that with the world and grow as a person and share that with others. You know, there are more courses coming. Stay tuned. There will be a certification program coming, which I think is really important in terms of who carries this work and has uh, licensing uh, to use our platform, etc. I wonder, Leah, whether it might be fun for you and I to close with a journey to our participants' future selves. What do you think? That sounds great. Why don't you start off and I'll finish it up. So let's take a moment to be present as we take a few deep breaths and center ourselves for a wonderful journey. As we breathe into our bodies in a relaxed way, Let's go together on a journey into our own personal future. With each new breath and exhalation, we just gently slip into our future vision for ourselves in the next two or three years. Just breathing gently into the future and just allowing yourself to envision yourself in that future state. As you gently breathe and relax, you just take note of where you are in the future. How are you feeling? What is your health like? Are you vibrant and wondrous health? What is the state of your body? Is it relaxed, healthy? Take a look at your surroundings as you breathe gently into your future. What are you doing? What are you enjoying? As you observe yourself, notice how are you giving? What are you learning? Take the next few breaths to really Relax into this vision of your future self in the next two or three years, noting all the things you're doing, how you're feeling, and exactly where you want to be. Contemplating your future self is the ultimate act of intention. It's really creating and recreating yourself every moment, every week, every month, every year. So the energy you put into this does shape your future. And now be that future self, as Leah has described. Be present two or three years from now and look back at your current self and take the wisdom and learning of the past few years the insights, the journeys you've done, the journeys you've given, how your business and practice and world service is thriving, how happy you are and peaceful you are, how loving you are and the impact of that, of those around you and those you serve, and send those insights and wisdoms back to your present self. Just imagine that you can cross time and space like this so that what you've learned in the next few years can actually be appreciated now and it creates a beautiful biofeedback loop between future selves. It could be the self six months from now or six weeks from now or six years from now. We're just picking years two or three. Understand that really we have an existence far beyond time and space. And if that's really true, Intending your future self makes it so now at certain levels of reality. So now, do both. Be here now in this body and present and there at the same time. Almost like you're hugging yourself. Two of you, a mirror image coming together, merging. In the merging, the sharing and the light, and the wisdom. And now just for fun, go to a future self 10 years hence. 
and see her or he, yourself, your ten yourself. And then merge with your ten yourself. Even more wisdom, even more insights, even more service. Yes, some trials and tribulations, they come and they go. And you can do this exercise anytime you want, 20 years into your future. You can do it in reverse and go to times in your past and reimagine those times. You are becoming, as we said earlier, a master of your own self first, your own consciousness, your own reality. And out of that mastery, you serve those you are called to serve, humanity, natural kingdom, whatever you're calling, at any scale. Your power to create, to manifest, is becoming remarkable. If the work we do serves you in some way, we're very happy about that. If there's other things that serve you well, please take them on, learn, contribute, and grow. As you become the master, we become your students. Imagine that possibility. Imagine all those you impact, now and into the future. Great ripples of light emanating from the core of your being. And when you're ready, give thanks. Come back into the room and have a wonderful day. And now we've come to the completion of this introductory course. We want to thank you for your time and attention and your work, your exploration, and your discovery. It is wonderful to work with you on all of these important and fascinating topics. To refresh your memory, we covered nine important things. Is it really possible to have meditation journeys and benefits in just five minutes. What kinds of journeys give the greatest benefits? Why spontaneous journeys have more juice? And the power, the meditative power of natural imagery, tapping the power of your childhood memories, exploring the power of awe. And what is the transmission? and journeys that transform negatives into positives. And finally, journeys that take you deeper, into deeper connections with self, others, and the universe. So you may well ask, what is next? And the answer is, there are many more courses coming and under development. You are now at the beginning stages of your mastery of becoming a journey guide. If you'd like to explore this further, please go to our website and see these offerings as they open up to give you a hint of what is evolving and emerging. How can I run my business based on the principles of energy and flow? How can I learn what it means to carry out the act of inner marketing? How can I grow my business, but still be in integrity, not become just a business person, but continue to be a meditation teacher, an energy healer, a wellness coach, so that the business elements of my work match the energy of my already existing skills. There'll be courses on this and many related topics into the future. And of course, as always, we value your feedback please use those feedback forms you'll find on the website. And finally, I want to do a closing journey with you. So come with me on this. Take a few deep breaths and adjust your posture to be comfortable if you haven't already. And come with me on a journey to the expansion of your mission and purpose 
and your impact in the world. Imagine, if you will, that it's five years in the future and you're connecting across time and space with all of your clients. And there are a lot of them. And they're diverse. And they need you. And they're hungry and longing for your teachings. And it, you found them easily. They found you easily. They referred their friends and their trust circles to you, not because you're terrific, but because they felt the impact of your work on their hearts and their souls. And when someone feels that, they want others to know it and to share it. So take a moment now, just a silent moment, and feel your expanded audience and client base. And we are working, of course, across time and space. A critical skill that you are developing. Because if you can connect across time and space, it enlivens and enriches your website, your blogs, your business cards, your conferences. Sometimes, as energy practitioners, we go linear when we try to market. And nothing can be more disastrous because we shrink ourselves. So now see yourself in your energy field getting large and larger and even larger. And this biofield, as the scientists now call it, interacts with all you could serve and may serve and probably will serve. And they too, of course, have a biofield. So in a sense, you're connecting with all the potential biofields for your possible future. Feel your way into that. It's a possibility, but you're now intending it. And the power of that intention is remarkable. And now pick one imagined client in the future and see him or her transformed because of your work. Could be physical issue, emotional issue, thought constructs, spiritual dilemma. Just see the light come on in their eyes, stress leaving their bodies, the awakening you've helped invoke in them. And use this individual as your archetype, your ideal client, the ideal result. And see their energy field expand thanks to your healing and helping work. And now take that same sense to all the hundreds, maybe thousands of people you will serve in the future. And hold the vibration and tone of that, if you will. Can you hear it? Can you hear the song, the music of the spheres, the tingling of awakening? Can you sense your impact in the world, your humanity in the planet? Can you feel it now in your own body as your heart opens and your power flows through you, which is not really your power anyway? living your purpose, loving, caring, being abundant. Feel all the possibilities. And when you're ready, give thanks. Come back into the room and have a wonderful day.